Okay, are we, oh, it's working. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Robert Tayar. I'm a 15 year IT veteran, maybe 20, uh, primarily in networking. What we're gonna present today is our current server farm topologies as well as our new CLOS topology. Uh, towards the end, you're gonna see some hardcore numbers on VXLAN and EVPN that we did with load generators. Uh, I'll start off by covering our requirements and why we went to this topology, because when you go to cloud, you should always ask why. Uh, second person that will be speaking today is Shri, and he'll go through our new security requirements, followed by Jason, who will actually cover those hardcore numbers. Uh, first slide, Walmart's big. Uh, you know, we're all reminded of this. 2.2 <laughs> uh, million associates were bigger than some countries. Uh, the reason we bring this up is because as a large company, we also have large processes. Uh, this is not how long it takes to do new compute anymore, but when I came in five years ago, it was pretty bad. And for the compute, each team had to be hit in order. And I'm not listing all of the teams, but suffice to say, it could be six months, sometimes a year, before you actually got the compute on the floor. Why? As you hit each team, we had processes. There are typical processes you see in... Uh, uh, a Fortune 500. Uh, you have a security review, you have to get on to the uh, facilities floor, change controls, clarity, and I'm not listing all of the processes. But for every process, every single team had to iterate that process. So you had engineers that were working extremely hard, extremely talented engineers that were buried in process. So why did we go cloud? It had as much to do with process as it did with, uh, with tech. Our current server farms, um, traditional core distribution access model uh, for the past 15 years, as far back as I can remember, this is what network engineers design towards. I'm going to bet most of you have the same type of a topology uh, somewhere in your data centers. Nexus 7K, 5K, uh, and a bunch of FX. Sorry. Uh, it's human resource intensive at every point. The f can you do this? <laughs> oh, wait, it's, it's I know it's gone crazy. It's flipping on itself. I told you, manual. Here, let me just. Do it. I'm sorry, guys. Just click it. Okay, so it's human resource intensive. Uh, it's kind of a bad diagram, but bottom line is we had to engage a team uh, for the firewall rules, another team for the network services, another team for the network, and a completely different team for the servers, and you had to follow the same process as I showed you on the previous slide. So even turning up a new network was resource intensive. Uh, all of the engineers want uh, layer three, because we don't like spanning tree issues, and all of the application folks and server folks want layer two for clustering. We can't agree on anything. Uh, it was approximately 1.1 million before you could put the first compute in the topology, and it took forever to put the first topology in. And large spanning tree domains, which will be a theme on the next slides. Go ahead and click it. Engineers and the business didn't exactly have the same requirements, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, but there are a couple of themes. Our theme is we needed to stop outages, we needed to stop human error. Uh, a lot of it had to do with spanning tree, and we had new security requirements. We had to build uh, dedicated infrastructure for PCI and other types of security, and so we would literally put firewalls at the top of the rack, very expensive, overbuilt, and you had to do it every time you wanted to have a security domain. Go ahead and click. So why CLOS? Well, it's very deterministic. No matter where you are in the CLOS topology, you're three hops. In that traditional 752 model, if I wanted to cover across an L3 boundary, you had to go up to the distribution switch, which is a lot of hops. And we had problems with organic growth. In other words, the business would come to the engineers, whether it's on the West Coast or the East Coast or in Bentonville, and they would say, I want compute and I want compute right now. And we would rush to get the compute in before lockdown in October, and layer two might have gotten a little out of control as we were trying to turn it up quickly. Uh, so with a cloth fabric, it's three hops anywhere. 
there are no snowflakes. We are using the same access cabinets, whether it's Cassandra, Ceph, General Compute, name your workload, same top of racks, it's the same. I can go 12,000, I think it's on the next slide, a lot of ports, I can scale insanely wide. Um, our current high-level topology, we use OSPF strictly to learn the endpoints. It is our underlay, that's what I'm responsible for. We have two very talented engineers, one couldn't be here today, named Daniel Justice and Pavan, who's somewhere in the audience. Uh, we are at about 90% on no touch. I don't touch the switches anymore, I'm getting rusty, right? Uh, the, the underlay is completely auto-deployed, we pixie boot the switches up. Uh, he auto carves the addressing and it applies it to the config. Even the slash 31s that are in uh, this topology are automated. Uh, PCI has to traverse the uh, distribution layer uh, between the uh, internal and the external border leaves. MPBGP is what we use for a control plane. Uh, uh, the VXLAN standard does not uh, dictate a particular control plane. We could have used multicast. We preferred BGP because most network engineers know BGP. It's a standard table. Much easier to troubleshoot. Um, I'll go back one more real quick and I'll wrap up. 12,288 compute ports, 12 open stack fault domains. All of the L2 and the L3 terminates in the top of rack. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Shri who's going to focus in on the security requirements and then we'll get to the performance numbers. Thank you, Bobby. Um, so today I'm going to be t covering uh, some of our security opportunities and challenges that we face at Walmart and how we try to solve them in this iteration of our clause design. Um, so at any big company, uh, there's two competing priorities. Um, you want your developers to be able to move fast, uh, be able to do uh, uh, services and deploy applications into production quickly. but on the other hand, you also want to have some sort of governance and process around uh, things getting to production, um, especially around security. Um, so um, prior to this, all of the uh, most of the most of the workloads were being handled through physical uh, build outs, which kind of slow, which was slow and process uh, driven. Um, with the new design, we're hoping to ease some of that pain and build security into the deployment process itself, right? So uh, one of the first things we kind of settled on was um, uh, we're going to run multiple security tiers or application tiers on the same physical infrastructure. Um, uh, similar to how public clouds run it, right? Like you go to Azure, you can run all your workloads uh, on Azure, but you don't have different uh, clouds for your PCI workloads or management workloads versus like web tier. Um, we're uh, w the other requirement was to enable fine-grained access controls uh, between applications and services. Um, the Third one uh, was to bake that security process into the application lifecycle. Um, we're not going to touch on this a lot today, uh, but if you want to uh, talk about it, we can do it after the talk. Uh, we have an uh, open source tool called OneOps that we use to control some of this policy. Um, the, the last two uh, is to enable our security team to have visibility into uh, into the cloud and see what's happening uh, and have some sort of controls on who can change policy and having the right review for uh, policy changes. Um, so before I get into the uh, design uh, and the solution, uh, we're using VRFs to uh, uh, do core segmentation between our security tiers. And for people who are not familiar with what a VRF is, uh, here's the Wikipedia definition. It's, uh, I'm not going to read it, but at, at a high level, um, from a network point of view, it's a different routing cable. Uh, uh, running within the same physical router. Uh, and for people who are more familiar with Linux, uh, think of it as uh, a Linux namespace where you have a different network stack to handle uh, uh, different uh, kind of tiers or applications. So uh, one of the first requirements was to be able to do network segmentation uh, between applications and having to do for, uh, fine-grained controls between apps. So before we get to that, uh, I'm, I'm going to 
hopefully that's, that's the, the diagram is a little bit clearer uh, on, on the big screen. Um, uh, we're using uh, WERF as a security boundary. So we have multiple WERFs uh, uh, based on our security tiers. We, we might have a WERF for PCI. We, might have, uh, we would have a WERF for like our management traffic. Um, we might have a WERF for internal traffic and then uh, and, uh, uh, another WERF for handling uh, web, web tier or, like, or application traffic, which doesn't need a whole lot of security around it. Right. And, and the reason we did this uh, was to leverage the same infrastructure, network infrastructure, but do different things based on uh, security policy. So, f uh, for instance, uh, like the PCI WERF um, can send traffic out to a firewall or IDS system and a security stack, which, uh, which is needed uh, to handle that, that sort of uh, data classification or security tier. Um, we are mostly using stock Neutron with provider and tenant networks uh, and mapping each of those provider networks to one of those works, right? It's a one-to-one -one mapping, a, a provider network or tenant network or, or a VLAN maps to one of those security tiers. So uh, um, like a PCI workload uh, would be on a provider VLAN and that VLAN could be shared between uh, tenants uh, at the same security level. Um, the, the three options that, that we enable our users to use to do that uh, fine-grained uh, access controls is using the physical firewalls up there. Um, uh, that, that's, that's, that's done for the most secure workloads where we might need like a web application firewall, an IDS IPS system, and uh, um, uh, additional firewall functionality which is not within uh, OpenStack itself. The second option is to be able to use security groups within OpenStack uh, uh, to do fine-grained controls. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, later on the challenges of using security groups and uh, um, the issues around trying to do cross-region or cross-tenant access controls. Uh, and the last solution uh, that, that we can use is host-based or agent-based controls. Um, with this, I mean, uh, you could use something as simple as Chef or Puppet to control IP tables on the box, or you can use uh, um, agent-based. There are multiple agent-based solutions out there where uh, they not only do access controls, but they, they'll, they'll do file integrity checks and a whole bunch of other things for you, uh, for you to meet some, uh, some of your policy requirements. All right, so some of the challenges uh, that, that we face uh, in this environment. Um, because it's an ephemeral uh, cloud environment, IPs, keeping track of which IP falls into which security tier uh, is difficult. It's, it's not, the information is available to you, but there's no good tool to uh, tie this across all of our regions, across all of our clouds, across bare metal. So th that's one of the challenges uh, that we face where it's within a single OpenStack region, um, you can do fine-grained access controls. Uh, but as soon as you try going across regions, you, you need something to tie uh, IP to security tier across regions. And right now, we're, we're still exploring uh, a couple of options there. The, the other issues, all of these are under manageability around like multiple regions and having a centralized view uh, of your infrastructure for security, right? Um, not having visibility of like what traffic flows between, uh, between your uh, instances or containers across regions. Within a single region, um, you have that visibility. You, you, can, you can enable some functionality within OpenStack to, uh, to log drops. Uh, and feed that into your uh, uh, InfoSec system. Uh, and the last one is being able to audit policy across your infrastructure. Um, right now, uh, it, it's, it's a little painful to actually do that and have a centralized view across all of your OpenStack regions. Uh, things we hope solve some of our uh, pain points are firewall as a service. Right now, uh, it's not production ready. I, I believe uh, the last one was, it was marked as uh, 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 the API is being uh, uh, 
redone, uh, and we hope like it's something that we can leverage in the future. Uh, another big thing is uh, our security team needs to be able to tap and see what traffic is flowing in and out of uh, uh, VMs or containers. Um, we, we've, we've been following Tap as a Service for a while now. Like I think a couple summits, uh, there's been presentations around Tap as a Service, but it's still not something which is an upstream neutron as yet. And the last one is actually being able to virtualize our entire security stack. Um, being able to kind of have a policy around uh, a deployment and uh, having that all virtualized with VNFs uh, and orchestrated uh, using OpenStack itself. So now I'm going to hand it over to Jason to go over more of the details on uh, uh, our design. Yep, so I'm going to talk, you know, mostly from a uh, Neutron perspective and how, you know, we tied in BGP, uh, EVPN into Neutron. And I think the important aspect is, you know, we got to understand, you know, there was a pretty aggressive timeline with the solution. Uh, and as Bobby hit on earlier, you know, we had a lot of layer two issues and our number one goal was to, you know, solve those issues. Uh, and so we wanted something that was, you know, had great performance at scales. Uh, you know, being Walmart, you know, any solution we deploy has to be highly scalable. Uh, and then also, you know, something, you know, that we could quickly deploy to fix the issues that uh, were touched on earlier. Uh, and, and for that, uh, you know, we're leveraging, you know, MP, BGP, EVPN. Uh, operationally, it was very easy to integrate. Uh, we already, ha we already uh, have like the top of rack switches, everything's monitored. Uh, from a Neutron perspective, uh, we're already using Linux Bridge. Uh, so being able to abstract, uh, all the c not adding all the complexity with OVS and, and Neutron allowed us to uh, build this solution and actually get it deployed quickly. So this is just a uh, high level overview of you know what an OpenStack region you know looks like. Uh, as you can see, we're terminating layer two at each top of rack switch, uh, and then we're and then we're extending the provider networks uh, with EVPN across multiple racks. Uh, so and you know like I said earlier, just Neutron is just you know plumbing in you know a provider network through Linux Bridge. So this is more of a uh, detailed view of how, a, how, how the compute node, uh, you know, and how a VLAN that we tag down from the top of rack switch, how it actually maps into our uh, EVPN in the top of rack and, and how the hardware VTEP will uh, route out the traffic. So I'm just gonna go through uh, each of the steps. So on the compute node, we have an instance which is uh, plumbed into the Linux bridge, which is the QBR bridge. Uh, and then we have a VLAN sub-interface, which maps to a specific provider network. Uh, and now that provider network will map into a, uh, a tenant VRF. Uh, and so, you know, we, so if we wanted to, let's say, you know, launch an instance in the PCI zone, we would just associate it with the provider network that's in the PCI VRF. Uh, and then once, so, uh, once it hits into the top of rack switch, we're, we're associating VLAN, in this case 1301, to VNI 5001, and as you can see, it lives in a specific VRF. Uh, and then from there, it'll, uh, so then it'll hit the, the VTEP, and the VTEP will either do bridging, layer two bridging, if it's going to another endpoint in the same uh, logical network, or if it's going, to a different VNI, it'll then do uh, L3 VXLAN routing. Uh, so I touched on, I pr touched on this earlier. Um, you know, we wanted to move fast. Uh, we there's a lot of different solutions that you know we're looking at longer term. Uh, you know, to do application driven and then integrating, uh, you know, OpenStack via the ML2 plugin. Uh, but for this, it was just a uh, it was just a quick win that we could use to solve our uh, our existing uh, issues and operational challenges. Uh, and you know, see. And uh, one of the one of the nice things uh, 
with uh, this solution, we get you know high performance. Uh, and I'm going to go into you know detailed benchmarks showing you know what kind of uh, performance you could expect. You know, go into this model. And uh, the, so also the distributed routing. Uh, so we looked at the DVR solution in Neutron. Uh, and you know that adds significant complexity, especially for our like compute team to manage. Uh, so by leveraging this this model, uh, we keep all the networking guys you know doing the networking, and then on the compute side, they just have to worry about Linux Bridge. So just an overview of our test setup that we've we conducted the testing with. Uh, we used the just you know come up, just standard HP you know DL three sixty servers. Uh, 512 gig of memory. Uh, this is just our typical, you know, hypervisor configuration. Uh, and then for the networking, we used uh, the Cisco 92160 uh, top of rack switches. Uh, each compute node is connected to the top of rack with 10 gigabit links. And then each of the top of racks do ECMP uh, up to two spines at 40 gig. So all tests were done on Ubuntu 1404. Uh, so, and then just describing the specific tests. Uh, so we did a couple of tests. Uh, one was TCP UDP test at you know varying packet sizes. Uh, we wanted to measure the performance, uh, you know, for small packet sizes and also at large. Uh, for latency tests, used uh, NetPerf. So did a TCP uh, request response test. Uh, so to measure how many transactions per second we could do. So the higher, the better. Uh, and then also wanted to stress uh, the scale of the, of the fabric. Uh, so we wrote uh, a couple of custom Python scripts to, that just basically does an ARP uh, and you know, sends an ICMP packet. Uh, and that'll generate thousands and thousands. That'll simulate thousands and thousands of endpoints to see how the performance is with large table sizes. Uh, so a couple of the performance tests uh, we did, one was uh, the L2 VXLAN. So what's the performance uh, within a logical network? Uh, and then also L3 VXLAN, so routing across different VNIs. Uh, and then the final test was to measure the performance uh, from one VRF to another VRF. In, in the same fabric. Uh, and also as a stress test, we did, uh, we used uh, an application mix that simulated 5,000 unique flows uh, with the varying different types of traffic, you know, with, that you would commonly find SMTP, RDBMS, HTTPS, BitTorrent. Uh, and that was transferring at around 50 gigabits per second while I conducted all of the, the L2 VXLAN, L3 VXLAN and interverf tests. Uh, so that was to see if load on the fabric had any impact on performance. Uh, and then finally was the 50K table size test using the custom Python scripts. Uh, and also wanted to see if, if that had any impact. So this is just a uh, overview of uh, each of the tests. Uh, you could see the L2 test, where all the tests were conducted across two endpoints uh, that were connected to two different uh, top of rack switches. So it was three hops away, uh, with the exception of the VRF test. Uh, the VRF test actually goes through, has to go up to the external border leaf, because that's where we're actually terminating all the VRFs, and that's where the firewall and security stacks uh, for cross VRF traffic. Uh, so right between the internal border leaf and external border leaf, that's where all the security devices will live so we could uh, apply policy across VRFs and zones. Uh, see, and so also, uh, for, so to start the benchmark for the layer two performance, the first thing I wanted to do was to determine, you know, what, what's the baseline performance of the top of rack switch with just a simple VLAN? Uh, and then two compute nodes connected to that same talk of rack switch. So, so one switch hop. Uh, and as you see on, on the throughput L2 test, uh, when it says L2, that's basically the baseline test. That's one hop. And then next to it, you have the layer two VXLAN test. 
uh, and that one is measuring three, that one's going three, three hops, so it's going tour, spine, tour. Uh, so there is a little latency uh, introduced because we're going through more, more devices. Uh, but on the throughput test, you could see uh, there's the percent decrease. So that basically measures, uh, was there a performance decrease? Uh, and if it's positive, uh, there was, but if it was negative, then it actually was slightly faster. Uh, and you, as you could see, the max out of all the tests at different packet sizes, uh, both with TCP and UDP, the most was 2%. Uh, and that could just be accounted to the variation between tests. So the variation was about 3 to 5%, you know, during each test run. Uh, and then on the latency, you could see that the highest was 10% at small packet sizes. So that's the TCP request response test. Uh, and the main reason for that, I associate to the additional uh, networking hops. Uh, and then on the right side, this is where you could actually see uh, the impact that uh, the table size of so 50,000 endpoints or uh, the application mix would have on the test. So while we were doing the performance test, we had two bare metal endpoints that were transmitting traffic between each other. And then we had several other bare metal hosts generating the at mix traffic and also simulating the large uh, table sizes. Uh, so, the, so the test, the systems under test were not running the at mix. And as you could see, uh, there was really no, there was no, uh, no performance difference, uh, both for throughput and latency. Uh, for the layer three performance, uh, this, it was basic, so the layer three performance is measuring uh, the difference between the layer two VXLAN and then the layer three routed VXLAN performance. So, you know, routing across different VNIs. Uh, and as you could see, uh, there is no, no delta. I, I mean, right here, it's, uh, you know, we're at like 0%. So we're running at, you know, essentially a uh, line rate with VXLAN because uh, the VXLAN is offloaded in the top of rack switch. Uh, and also, uh, app application mix and then the large table sizes didn't have any impact on performance. Uh, and the final, t final test was the, the, was the inner verf test, uh, so measuring the performance. And, and even that, uh, w there was no drop in throughput. Uh, the only thing that increased was the latency. And that was, and that, and that could be a result of going through, you know, additional hop, network hops, because as I showed before, it has to go all the way up to the border leaf. So in summary, uh, you know, this, so this solution with, you know, Linux Pridge and using MP, BGP, uh, and VXLAN offloaded uh, performs, you know, very similar to bare metal speeds. Uh, so there was no, no uh, noticeable performance decrease. Uh, and, you know, we know it scales to, you know, at least 50,000 endpoints. At one point, we even had 90,000 MAC addresses into the fabric. And uh, there was no, no noticeable issue, uh, and everything kept wor running and working. So with that, I'm going to lead into uh, questions. So uh, first off, uh, this is probably one of the best uh, use case sessions I've been to all week. Um, so thank you for that. The uh, first off on the testing, did you do testing between um, VMs I, uh, either in the same tenant or between tenants on a sing single physical server and look at the load and latency testing there as well? Yeah. yeah. So for for all the testing, uh, so so one of the goals was to you know measure the performance of the fabric itself. Uh, and so I wanted to eliminate as much in the, uh, as much in the data path as possible, uh, because like we're using Linux Bridge today, we already know the performance of it; it's already tested. Uh, so all the tests were on bare metal servers uh, with 802.1.q interfaces, and then we, I would run the test between the two endpoints uh, of the two bare metal hosts that would live in two different racks with two different top of rack switches. There, there was one point of clarification. I think it was stated that the, uh, uh, the verfs lived up on the external border leaves. Uh, if we go up to, uh, what is it with me in this thing? 
Um, to the external border leaves, that would be the switches at the very top. Uh, the fabric actually ends at the internal border leaves, and we're playing a little old network trick, because I'm an old Grizzly network guy, uh, and we worked with our vendor, and we're actually trunking uh, across all verfs up to the external border leaf. So the external border leaf is not verf aware, right? Uh, it, the fabric actually ends at the internal border leaf. That's just a, a layer three hop. So it's trunk through the firewall, layer three out. Thank you. Question uh, over here on this mic. Can you talk a little bit about failure modes, resiliency, any testing you've done there, um, maybe on the BGP part in particular? No, we ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's probably the next thing that uh, Jason and I have to test. Um, I can tell you we've had, uh, we have tested some failures, but I'd rather not go into it until we have ICSI up and running and I can give you some hardcore bench numbers. So, uh, yeah, that's where we're at. We're, that's, that's the next testing we do. Uh, I have a question that uh, uh, in your design, there should be a Hastin controller or a switch manager in, uh, in the fabric, right? Yeah, yeah, so there's that, so for when you talk a controller, you, re, you mean in like uh, that you know, Neutron is talking to, like as a plugin or? Is that uh, but as far as I know, Neutron plugin cannot uh, talk to the switches and uh, tell the switch you need a uh, wharf, you need a uh, bridge domain or something? Yeah, so, so for that, so actually too, so like, that's a good question. So to add, like let's say a new ver for, you know, provision a new VLAN that's mapped to a VNI, uh, we we're le initially leveraging uh, with Cisco VTS, uh, which, which will actually talk to all of the top of rack and uh, border leaf switches. Uh, so and I just go in, we just go in there and we'll add a new provider network, say it's associated to this VRF, and uh, it'll just pull from a VLAN pool that we specified and it'll provision across. And for, I guess for future, we're looking at, uh, you know, moving all of that configuration and automation uh, with Ansible. So every time we want to, you know, add a new VRF or, you know, we want to add a new, you know, private, you know, logical network, uh, we'll just use uh, Ansible, and then longer term is move into a controller model. Okay, I have heard of uh, VTS, and uh, uh, therefore the other question that uh, uh, you have showed the test result of the data plan and performance, but uh, if you introduce a new SDN controller, there is a, a biggest problem is the control plan performance, since you have two DB, right? Uh, uh, OpenStack uh, database and uh, the VTS database, there must be some problem like uh, the database may be not inconsistent or the transaction may be uh, not going, uh, going right uh, like this. Now, so as a clarification, um, uh, we're a very large company and so we have to contend with a lot of different type of workloads. So the one thing that we are working on is a controller. We are not using VTS the way VTS was intended to be used. Uh, we're kind of beating up our vendor to make it work how we want it to. And they've been very phenomenal about working with us. We're using it as configuration management only, right? Mm -hmm. It's literally just pushing out, here's the uh, VLAN in the appropriate VRF. If I personally have to figure out what VLAN goes in what VRF very quickly, um, it, it can get very kludged in the config if you do it by hand. So it's just a way to automate the configs. Okay, thank you. Question about uh, how you guys are spanning VLANs using VXLAN across different racks. Are you doing anything to egress locally from a rack which does not have uh, the the default gateway pinned down on it? Uh, explain a little bit further. I'm sorry. So you guys are taking a, pro uh, a provider network VLAN and putting it across multiple fan outs, right? Those fan outs are top of the racks are going to be your uh, L2 or L3 terminations. Well, you're talking about just a straight up layer two VLAN, like a cluster VLAN? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we do it. it to us, it's, there's no difference. Um, uh, we either make it an SVI or we don't. So uh, the internal border leaf either has an SVI for it. If it doesn't, the layer two stays local. So yes, those numbers that he was testing for like the L2, 
that, that was just a, a VLAN with no SVI. So the SVIs are all the way up at, on the internal border leaves for the uh, provider networks? Yes. Well, uh, I was going to, well, yeah, so, so we're using the distributed anycast router function. Uh, so the SVIs, uh, they really live in every top of rack as well. So, hello. Yeah, so I wanted to ask the question is uh, not more on the technology side, but, uh, uh, and I think I heard this correct, is that you guys were an L2 uh, topology. And so what was the change that you guys had to undergo uh, from your architecture and operations team to go directly to MPB, GPE, VPN? And I'll ask the second question after this. That's what we're about to fight. <laughs> Okay, and the second question is, I think so, uh, the gentleman out there already answered is, uh, right now it's not controlled by OpenStack, so there's nobody from your app developer team talking to Neutron plugin into some SDN controller that will control this, or do workload requests come in through some Jira ticket and then somebody does something about it? Yeah, so, so right now we have an abstraction layer uh, above our OpenStack regions. It, it's called OneOps. Uh, so once we provision a new provider network in our, in our fabric here, uh, it'll get at, it'll, we could orchestrate it to add it in the OneOps, and then OneOps will actually talk to OpenStack and actually provision the instances. And, and we are currently not doing this by hand. Uh, so VTS has APIs, so if I've got to push a new network, uh, we've already scripted it. Um, Everything that you see that we're doing is completely scripted. Um, we need to clean it up. Uh, the two engineers I spoke about, Pavan and Daniel, that's what we have them working on. So we'll have more good stuff at the next OpenStack. Yeah. No, so the request would be still coming in from the uh, app team to somebody, and that somebody will then do executions of scripts, correct? Well, yeah, not quite, right? Like, so we're going to have different VLANs or whatever, right? Different security tiers. And then uh, within our PaaS platform, um, tenants can be mapped to, like you, you match this PCI tenant, and then you are automatically going to launch, the PaaS tier is automatically going to launch your instances on the right network. But uh, like he said, like all of that, the automation around building those VLANs and tying them to WARFs is handled through the physical layer. That we're going to know ahead of time, like in terms of like, when do we need it? Are we running across space? Do we need more? Uh, and then that's, that's done by the, the underlay team. And then the, once our PaaS platform has the information, it's, uh, it's hidden from the customers. They just launch instances, and it happens to happen on the right network. Thank you. Hi. Um, I've got three questions. Um, the first one was with regards to Linux Bridge and the de decision to go to Linux Bridge instead of OVS. Um, and the second question was with regards to latency, what was your test environment for that? How did you measure latency? And the third question was related to packet loss. Um, with your traffic generation when you're going through the architecture, whether it's north, south, or east through west, um, how are you measuring that? All right, so I'll, I'll start on, uh, so, so the first one, uh, so why did we choose Linux Bridge? Uh, so we're deployed on uh, the Liberty release of, uh, of OpenStack. And uh, one of the things, we already use Linux Bridge, so you know, everyone's comfortable you know, with it. It's you know, proven in production. Uh, and then also uh, OVS, uh, it's fixed now, but you know, whenever you restart a Dell 2 agent, it would uh, drop all your flows when you're leveraging a provider network. But you know, that's, that's from what I understand, we're now resolved in uh, Metaka. But we're still on uh, the Liberty release. And then on the second one for how do we measure, uh, measure the latency, uh, so that was, you know, we used uh, NetPerf. It's an open source benchmarking tool. Uh, so, you know, just simple doing a simple TCP, you know, request response test between two bare metal endpoints. Uh, so one was running uh, the, Net, the NetPerf server and another was the client. 
and then just measured the time for a request to go from client to server and then server to client back. So the more transactions uh, per second, it actually meant the latency uh, on that test was lower. So the higher numbers on that one were actually better. Uh, and then uh, what was the third question? The packet loss. Yeah, so for, for the TCP uh, throughput test, um, you know, there was, there was, there was no, uh, no packet loss on those because uh, we're using it, because it is using uh, the TCP window. Uh, and, but for the UDP test, uh, that's probably the ones you're, you're mainly referring to. Uh, you know, when we're running the test, the packet loss was, uh, you know, minimal. It was about, you know, one to five percent is what I was seeing. Uh, and the goal of the UDP test was you know, really just to see, you know, hey, how much, you know, how, how much bandwidth, you know, can I throw, throw through the pipe, and how does that compare to, uh, to, the, to the layer two baseline test? Uh, and for the UDP traffic, uh, you know, the, I, I didn't notice a difference uh, from the layer two without VXLAN test. Uh, to the layer two VXLAN test and then the layer three VXLAN test. So it was consistent uh, across all the tests. I had, sorry, just one more question. On the spine and leafs, did, was that all white box and were you running? Um, we were going to test other topologies. This was the first one that we tested. Uh, we have a pretty big partnership uh, with a vendor that supports all of our stores. And you saw how many stores we have. Uh, so that was uh, 9508 Cisco for the spines, and those were 92 160s, brand new switches. Uh, they have one, 10, and uh, 25 gig to all servers, and uh, 40 and 100 gig native uplinks. So pretty beefy switches, perform very well. Uh, but we are also looking at Arista, and we're also looking at Cumulus, so the same testing that you see. We're doing that in our lab, uh, literally, we're, like next week. Are, are your next plans to start looking at network monitoring and visibility? That's a huge topic. That's a great question, and the answer is yes. Thank you. Uh, actually, I'll add on to that. Uh, we, we do, remember, we're very much of an enterprise, so we've been using HP NNMI. Uh, stat seeker and we realized that we need to look at some uh, open systems and uh, our other org uh, our, our compatriots on the west coast uh, I wish we'd had one of them up here to answer that question maybe we can answer it after this but yes there are a lot of open systems a lot of network management it's very impressive right we're out of time folks thank you for coming thank you